Katie Kaiser is the Collections and Exhibitions Assistant at the Dixon Gallery and Gardens, of course. And before her time at the Dixon, she worked at the Frist Center for the Visual Arts in Nashville and Vanderbilt University. She received her bachelor's degree in visual studies and art history at Western Kentucky University in Bowling Green and her master's in art history and museum studies at the University of Memphis. Her research interests include the art and visual culture of the United States and the African diaspora as well as the study of the arts in relation to community and social change. So now I will hand things over to Katie Kaiser. Thank you, Lindley. Yay. Hello, everyone. Let me go ahead and get my shared screen up here. Okay, just like that. Okay, so um, thank you all for being here today. As Lindley said, I'm the Collections and Exhibitions Assistant here at the Dixon. And um, I am going to go ahead and say that I have a very loud, sometimes unruly dog, and I hope that he behaves himself today. If he doesn't, I will pause, deal with him, and come back. So I hope we don't have to do that, but I couldn't get a babysitter today, so please forgive me um, if that does happen. Um, today we are going to be talking about still life painting in the Dixon Permanent Collection, and since we've got an exhibition of mostly portraits up at the Dixon right now, I thought that everybody might enjoy a little change of pace. So um, we do have the, the Four America sh the For America show up right now. If you guys haven't gone to see it, please do so. It's such a beautiful show. And um, if you haven't reserved your time, you've got about a month left. So right now with COVID, we are reserving time slots. Um, and I'm gonna include at the end of my talk, a link for you guys to um, go and reserve your time. So uh, just be sure to look for that. Um, so, if you guys remember in 2019, we had our eye to eye exhibition um, where we pulled a lot of works from the Dixon's permanent collection and we had um, them all throughout the galleries, not just the residence where we typically display the Dixon's permanent collection, but we had them pulled um, throughout all the galleries and it was really fun to make connections between works um, that we hadn't necessarily made before and you know with the residence galleries we sometimes are limited to small walls so it was really fun to um, see a lot of works alongside each other that we don't typically get to see alongside each other um, and our done event galleries were dedicated to our still lives um, so also uh, in dealing with our permanent collection um, Julie, Mallory Sharp, and myself, and of course, Kevin, we've all been working very hard on our forthcoming permanent collection catalog. So um, some of the works that I'll discuss today are ones that I have been doing research on. And I think at least one of the works that I mentioned is one that Mallory um, wrote on. So a big thank you to her for um, sharing her research with me. Um, of the 150 or so paintings in the Dixon's permanent collection, there are only about 16 that are true still lives. Um, and so it's a small but mighty genre in the Dixon's permanent collection. Still life is a highly accessible art form. So unlike portraiture, which relies on the presence of another person, um, or landscape paintings, which can sometimes be limiting in terms of access to space or travel, um, or if the artist is working on plein air, then of course weather conditions are taken into account. Um, on the other hand, still life is an entirely democratic um, genre of painting. Uh, these compositions can be made with everyday objects just lying around the artist's home or studio. So as such, it's witnessed various trends in popularity. And there have been certain times throughout history that it's been considered sort of lowbrow and then other times that it's been some of the most desirable avant-garde art on the market. 
just a very brief, incredibly brief history of still life painting. Um, it dates back centuries. So the first known still lifes are uh, attributed to the ancient Egyptians in 15 BCE, and they existed as funerary paintings and tombs. Lindley and I joked that when we went through a trial run of this, that uh, these looked like snow cones. So um, perhaps the Egyptians were sending uh, their dead with Jerry's, you know. Um, but the golden age of still life painting is considered to be 17th century Holland. And these works were known as Vanitas still lifes, and they often depict symbols of death and transience that speak to mortality. Um, and they were also moralistic in tone, so reminding us to be good and mindful humans um, because just like this piece of fruit here, we are all deteriorating and hopefully our bodies and soul, our souls will go to good places when we leave this, this earth. Floral still lifes were also very popular at this time and of course um, they wilt, they're living things that wilt as well. So again, another reminder of our mortality. So in the 19th century, um, there was a resurgence in still life painting and this was largely due to the growth of the middle class whose tastes ran to intimate, moderately priced works. You probably recognize these two works in the Dixon's permanent collection. And um, so these two were created about 30 years apart by Henry Fantan Latour. We have a work in our collection by Fantan Latour's wife that we um, acquired last year, uh, Victoria Duborg Fantan Latour. And so these artists were contemporaries of the Impressionists, but their work tended to be more traditionally academic. Um, so these would have been artists who frequently exhibited at the Parisian Salon, and they were interested in capturing um, objects to their utmost likeness. Um, so here, Victoria Dubourg Fantan Latour has included all of these different elements that she can render with, you know, the, the carefulest hand. Um, she's created this very bright reflection on the silver and how that kind of is different from the reflection on the porcelain that's a bit more muted and then the skin of the apple and then this very delicate champagne flute that you can see these little effervescent bulbs. If you haven't gotten up close enough to the painting to see the, the, um, the bubbles, do it. Um, because it's, it's one of my favorite parts of that painting. Um, but so, and I'll go back to this work by um, Fantan Latour. So with these being 30 years apart, it's interesting to kind of see how his work on the right, the later work, is much more expressive. You can see the artist's brush strokes. Um, so this, of course, is after, you know, the Impressionist exhibitions and, um, that style of art is becoming more avant-garde. So Fantan Latour is sort of trying his hand at this more avant-garde technique. And then you have artists um, like Edouard Manet and Cezanne who really started to push the boundaries um, in terms of still life by creating unique compositions of everyday objects, but playing with um, these very bold, rapid brush strokes and um, playing with color as well. So like many of Manet's still life compositions, this work is including these um, 17th century familiar elements. Um, However, like I said, there's a much more bold, expressive brushwork, and you can really see his execution, um, the speed of his execution in these works. Um, so these were more confrontational and considered unorthodox at the time. Um, so while some of the works that came before maybe seemed a little bit static, you know, this is very kind of, um, all of these objects are very set um, on this table. Here, this is uh, kind of a lively composition, even though it's depicting this dead fish. Um, and this is not a work that's in the Dixon's permanent collection, I'll, I'll say that, but it is an example of one of these um, still life paintings where um, the 
style is becoming increasingly modern. So this work you might recognize, all of this sort of sets the scene for 20th century still life painting. And that's primarily what I want to discuss today um, in the Dixon's permanent collection. So um, in the 20th century is when still life becomes a truly radical art form. And uh, this is inspired by the Impressionist and, and Symbolist movements and um, painting is becoming increasingly experimental. So this work by Edward Viard was created in 1905. Viard was a French painter, a decorative artist, and a printmaker, and he was involved with a society of artists called the Nabi. And this is Viard here um, with some of the other artists who were involved with the Nabi. So these artists were eager to, eager to distinguish themselves from the academicism and naturalism that was espoused by their former teachers, such as William Adolf Bouguereau and Jules Lefebvre. Um, though there wasn't a true collective style, they shared interest in similar techniques, such as simplified drawing, using flat, broad areas of color and bold contours and patterns. So in Viard's Still Life, painted in 1905, he's, he's retained this traditional um, subject matter, um, although this work is largely different from his predecessors. So we see uh, this lamp here, and there's the base of the lamp, and this vase here, and then the open book. Um, However, there's, a, there's some spatial ambiguity to this work. Um, it's a very abstracted work in comparison with the others. So he's incorporated pattern through the tablecloth that we see here. And I would even argue that there is some sort of China pattern on this vase. Um, but again, it's kind of hard to discern because it's um, very abstracted. So the tilt of this table, which this line here, I mean, this must be a rounded table. Um, and then the dark, the darkness of the background, this light is illuminating the table here. Um, the, the flatness, though, the flattened perspective of this work is um, derived from Japanese woodblock prints that the Impressionists had popularized. And of course, like, you know, all of these cherry blossoms. Uh, there's certain pat in the pattern of this cushion here. There's, um, there's patterns that are implemented in these Japanese woodblock prints that artists uh, like the art are, are inspired by. So instead of rendering each object and the composition with the same precision that Fantin Latour um, had done in uh, Dubourg, um, you know, Viard is not as much interested with showing how well he's able to render these objects. He's more interested in a very dynamic composition. Um, he is interested in light and shadow, and that is uh, shown by this, um, the lamp here and how the background is darkened in comparison. Um, so his treatment of light and shadow, it really captures a mood, which is interesting. And like so many of Viard's paintings, there's this mystery, um, a tension between these everyday objects and the tone of the painting. Um, so anyways, it's a great work at the Dixon. Excuse me, I'm gonna get some water. Okay, so George Brock, we're fast forwarding about 20 years now. Um, and it, uh, this work, Pot of Anemones, is one of my favorites in the Dixon's collection. So Brock, like Viard, was a Frenchman. And uh, by the time that he created Pot of Anemones in 1925, he was 43 years old and he had already established himself as one of the most consequential artists of the modern world. Um, alongside Pablo Picasso, he dedicated himself to experiments in analytic cubism and fragmentation. Um, so it was an entirely original art form that the two of these men created, and they, their works uh, challenged spatial conventions 
uh, by using geometric forms and manipulating planar fields. So from 1907 until 1914, he and Picasso worked together and independently on their famous papier collé, which is French for paper collage. And um, so they combined various media such as newspaper clippings, which is what we see in this work, um, and menus, uh, different, you know, different types of media with printed words. Um, and then they combined these with drawn elements and hand-painted papers and disparate patterns. So you've got the wood grain um, of this uh, piece here that he has attached. Um, and so these works typically experimented with text as this one does. He created more than 50 of these paper collages between 1912 and 1914. So Brock was profoundly interested in relaying the tactile qualities of everyday objects. And his oeuvre is dominated by mantelpieces, as we see here, and um, side tables that are filled with uh, fruit and books and musical instruments. Um, the, in the Dixon's painting, we see um, a, oh, oh no, sorry. We see a, um, a pitcher full of multicolored flowers. And on the right here, I've included this, an up close of the wood grain effect that he's um, incorporating on the surface of this table. Um, and it's interesting, he actually, when he began his artistic career, he was trained by his father in decorative arts and he created lots of faux finishes. So it's interesting how that translates to his um, fine art practice. Um, and then also you can see these little textured specks of white throughout. It's kind of difficult to see. It's, it's, it's easier to see up close um, in person. Um, so check it out the next time you get a look at the work. Um, but he created his own grounds by combining salt and uh, sand, I'm sorry, and paint. And um, and so this gray here is the, the ground um, of the painting. So he leaves some of it exposed, this primed area of canvas, and it even peeks through, you know, here in the corner of the wall. Um, but that was something that he played with frequently. And the, the textured element that the sand provided allowed him to uh, explore texture in a way that enhance the surface of the canvas um, and kind of, you know, showcase the two dimensional. So he's, he's experimenting with flattened forms and then he is experimenting, he's heightening the, the flattened surface of his canvas even more so through the texture that he's incorporating. And it's interesting how he creates this, um, this wood grain appearance by, it looks like he's just drug a tool through the paint, like almost like a Zen garden or something. Um, and I think that that's a really um, nice technique. Let's see. So although we can't see the, the legs of this table here, you know, he often created these compositions where you could see um, his little three-legged tables. Um, although we can't see that here, uh, we do understand that, you know, we can spatially understand that this work is set in the corner of a room. So we've got these exaggerated verticals and horizontals here. And it's as if he's, he's pushed this table up in the corner of a room. Um, I do not for the life of me know what this object is. And I would be very curious if anybody has any ideas. Um, I've looked at this painting for a long time now, but it's, I just, I can't decipher what it is. It almost looks like a pair of like crumpled cowboy boots or a some sort of, um, you know, like there might be a candle inside, like this light and shadow that I'm seeing here. Like I, I can't decipher exactly what it is, but it's very interesting. And, um, and he incorporates this book, um, you know, kind of, paying tribute to his papier collet and his incorporation of text and 
those works. So he's included, even though it's illegible, he's included text in this work as well. Um, and he did so frequently. Also note his signature there if you didn't already on that. Um, it's, it's there on as the table kind of rounds um, and you can see it better here. Um, but I always like looking for artists' signatures and works. Uh, so although the rational eye perceives, you know, this, he's using very abstracted forms and very flattened forms. And although we perceive this vase to be sitting in front of this wall, it is interesting, especially with this kind of strange rabbit figure that you see here. I mean, he looks like a little rabbit to me. Um, it's interesting how your eyes kind of do play tricks on you because he has treated this white of the picture the same way that he has treated the wall. And um, it's just, it's kind of interesting to consider how spatially that is a bit disorienting. Um, let's see. I guess that's all that I also, I mean, I guess his treatment of light and shadow here, as I mentioned over on this side and how he uses this lightning bolt here to divide the picture into light and shadow in a very abstracted way is interesting. And it's different than Viard's uh, attention to light and shadow, but still it's playing a part of his composition and uh, it's interesting to take note of. Okay, so now we will move on to Hoarder. Um, he was a modernist that was living in the United States. So Hoarder was largely self-taught and he began his career in New York as a draftsman working at an advertising agency. He developed a reputation for drawing crisp, sharp lines uh, for some of the company's best known advertisements while studying etching at the Art Students League. And his earliest success in etching came when he received a silver medal for smelters, Pittsburgh at the Pan American Exhibition in 1915 in San Francisco. So Hoarder was also a well-known modern art collector, and although he kept very little records of his personal collection, which eventually comprised 80 paintings, sculptures, and drawings, um, and prints as well, um, his earliest documented acquisition took place at the Armory Show on March 9th, 1913, and he purchased a series of lithograph prints by Viard. So, that's kind of interesting to make these connections between artists and our collection. Um, so this series titled Paysage a Interiors um, is the series that he purchased there and it's his first known purchase. Um, he also collected the work of Brock and Picasso and he owned about 30 works by these artists dated between uh, 1909 and 1914. So again, another interesting connection between artists and our collection that Hoarder collected. Uh, in addition to producing his own work, which we own, he also collected. Um, so he, the works that he collected and his studies, um, his studies in Europe and the modernist circles that he affiliated with, all of these um, things helped to contribute to his work becoming more experimental. And um, he created Untitled Cart around 1935. And so this is fairly late in his career. Although he rarely copied works in his own collection, it does resemble um, this work. Oops, where do I go? this work by George Brock, um, which he did own. Um, and it's called Still Life Second Study. So like Brock, um, Hoarder depicts a fragmented tabletop. So here we're seeing this tabletop view is kind of, um, I mean, it's very abstracted, but I think we're looking at it from um, above. And then, you know, we've got the objects that are set on top of the tabletop that we sort of see um, head on um, his cart here, which is a men menu in French, and you can kind of see the outline of um, the edge of the menu there. This uh, resembles Brock's cafe uh, text here. 
So, and then we've got this abstracted bottle and these abstracted glasses. I believe that's an abstracted glass. Um, these same elements uh, can be found, my, my face is blocking my, um, my screen. Um, so they can still be seen here. Um, these abstracted bottles that he's incorporated and in this glass there. And then also he incorporates the same wood grain effect that um, Brock used. And I can't decide, I've gone back and forth. I want to say that this is the edge of the table, this kind of white halo around, um, but also it kind of mimics the same shape as the, well, is it gonna go back? I'm trying to go back, but it's not letting me. What if I, oh, move. there we go. Um, so it kind of mimics the guitar too, um, and the shape of the guitar, which is incorporated. So I don't know, um, but it's very interesting. And also the composition is um, fairly architectural, which recalls uh, Hoarder's early um, etchings of street scenes. Um, so that's an interesting connection as well. Okay, so I love this painting by Grace Martin Frame Taylor. Um, the work is titled Tabletop Still Life from 1938. And Grace Martin Frame Taylor was another painter and printmaker with ties to Philadelphia, like Hoarder. Um, she studied painting at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts under uh, Arthur B. Carls and Daniel Garber. And the artist who arguably had the largest impact on her career was Blanche Lazelle, her cousin. Um, this is a, a print by Lazelle. So Lazelle was an internationally known modernist and experimental printmaker. And um, she was living and teaching in West Virginia and um, Taylor uh, received some training from her. So she interestingly enough um, has connections to another work in the Dixon's permanent collection. So. Uh, Lazelle had trained in Paris under Fernand Legere. Um, and under his training, she became well versed in cubism and abstraction. And um, so when Lazelle returned to the United States, she worked with a group of painters in Provincetown, Massachusetts, and pioneered a method of printmaking called the white, called the white line method. Um, and this technique, instead of, it's inspired by Japanese uh, woodblock printing. Um, and instead of using multiple woodblock prints to create a single print, um, the artist would use one large um, piece of wood and would create the composition, would draw the composition, create the grooves in the wood, um, apply color, and then between, um, between the different blocks of color would appear these white lines, which are here. Um, and that's how the, the method derived its name. Um, it, was a, it was much more efficient um, than, the, than the woodblock print making and cheaper too, because you don't have to buy multiple pieces of wood to um, you know, apply your color and create your composition. And it's interesting to see these ties between, especially with these two works, because they were both created in 1926. Um, it's interesting to see how Lazelle is inspired by Legere with these blocks of color and how these kind of black lines that are delineating his composition become the white lines of her composition. Um, and that, but she also, she includes this little, uh, you know, these squares here, these lines of black color, which um, I like to think she is, uh, she is um, giving him some tribute there. So um, Taylor then starts to use this white line uh, method of printmaking. And she was working as an educator in Charleston um, during the school year. And then during the summer, she would study with Lazelle in Provincetown. And um, under her mentorship, she begins to create these works um, with elements of abstraction and combining the modernist sensibilities 
uh, that she had developed in Philadelphia. So this work is titled Studio Window, and I think it's one of her best known uh, white line prints. So she created um, tabletop still life early in her career. Um, this is 1938, and it's reminiscent of Brock's compositions, his tabletops and mantle pieces. Um, but we can see how she is combining her interests as a printmaker with these white lines that she outlines her um, table and objects with. Um, so she's combining those sensibilities, her sensibilities as a painter and what she's learned about abstract art from her cousin who studied in France and would have been familiar with um, the artists who were working in that manner, such as Brock. And then she combines, though, the, the white line method of printmaking by painting this white line to outline her compositions. Um, let's see. She, um, oh, also, I like how she has, in scraping her paint in these very thin layers, she sort of, um, hearkening to uh, Brock's wood grain effect again, um, which I think is, is interesting. And also she's playing with light and shadow here. I see this peach colored band as light that is illuminating a darkened room. Like if you were to crack open a door into a darkened room and this light that's flooding the space, um, you know, it just falls in this band here. And then, you know, you've got the shadows that are created by these darker colors. It's interesting how um, she has created this study of light and shadow with these contrasting blocks of color. Okay, so now we are going to talk about Marc Chagall, whose work you are probably familiar with um, in the Dixon's collection, and I really love uh, the two works that we have by him. So he's a Russian artist um, who lived in both Paris and the United States. Um, this work is the later of the two works that we have um, in our collection. So Chagall was an incredibly product, had a, an incredibly productive career. It spanned 75 years, and he created over 10,000 works during that time. So this painting, painted in 1945, um, was painted after the death of his wife, Bella. And here's Bella there, and their daughter, Ida. Um, I think they're just such a sweet couple. I like looking at them. Um, so the devastating loss um, led him to create several nocturnal scenes and inspired by his vivid dreams, um, these works often depict um, a bride and groom as we see here. Um, the, the basket of fruit um, is a traditional symbol of youth and fertility. I mean, it harkens back to uh, Dutch still life painting. And, um, and oops, sorry, I keep doing that. Um, and so he, um, I'm sure he's thinking about the bleeding nature of life and how he's lost his, his uh, wife. And um, we have these, this pair of lovers here beneath the basket of fruit and the incorporation of um, the goat there. Um, the goat was a symbol of um, abundance and uh, hope. And, um, and then we also see in the background these buildings here, this, this um, cityscape in the background. And since 1940, he and Bella had been living in New York. Um, they had to flee Paris because of the Nazi persecution of Jews. So they were living in New York since uh, 1940. Um, and so this is sort of, you know, biographical, these elements that he's added in here. The work is very similar stylistically to our bouquet of flowers that we have um, in the Dixon's collection. And um, 
1927, Chagall had already established himself uh, as um, he, he had achieved international acclaim. Uh, the painting depicts a bride and groom again, and we see the goat playing the violin, and again another, um, you know, rooftop view in the distance, and this bouquet of flowers, which occupies the center of the composition, replaces the basket of fruit that we saw in the last painting. Um, uh, I think in 1909, yes, in 1909, he, for the first time, um, started painting flowers in his works. They don't appear as a dominant thread, though, until uh, 1920, but in these earlier works, um, they just appear as symbols kind of commemorating birthdays, as in this work, or anniversaries, and um, this is a nice painting, and it's also interesting because in this photograph that I included, I don't know if, if you see back there, but that is that same painting that he created. Um, so in um, Bouquet of Flowers, they were living in Paris at this time and um, very much in love and recently married. And um, they, the incorporation of this um, Russian uh, Orthodox Church, this dome back here, uh, even though he's living in Paris, he's maybe thinking of his times in, um, in Russia. And so again, it's nostalgic. Um, but it's interesting how he has um, included his own biography in these still life compositions and um, how, you know, he's still, he's employing this very expressive brushwork and, um, and capturing these elements, which are very traditional uh, and, you know, dating back to 17th century, but how he includes these other symbols, which are unique to him and, uh, and to his life with his wife and how um, a narrative is established when he incorporates um, these elements. So I think that that concludes my talk for the day. Um, I have included here, so if you guys are inspired to create your own still life paintings or drawings, because it is a very democratic form of art, um, Mr. JT, if you've been following along on our social media, he, um, here, let me see if I can, I'm gonna copy and paste this in the comments, Lindley, so that people can copy and paste these in their own browsers. Um, let's see, how do I, oh, that's what I mean to do. Oh, okay, great. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna copy and paste this. And then you guys, so the first link is the link to JT's uh, tutorial on how to create a still life composition in your own home. And it's very fun and creative and you guys should do that. And if you are sick of still life and you wanna go see portraits at the Dixon, then the second link is for you to schedule your visit to go to the Dixon. So do that. Well, thank you, Katie, that was great. Oh, um, we have a few questions and some comments. Um, it seems all you have to do is mention a mystery object and it gets people excited. So we have some different guesses on what that mystery object is. But um, one question is uh, with the Manet, um, the Manet with, you know, with the dead fish and everything, uh, was Manet trying to be slightly shocking with his depiction of the dead fish and oysters and eel or snake or whatever that was? Or were those typical still, still life subjects um, that we just kind of see as being sort of a little gross and shocking? Those were typical still life subjects and those dated back you know, to 17th century Dutch still life. Um, and just like, um, just like the fruit, those things deteriorate and die. And so those had been long um, uh, elements that had been incorporated in still life painting. And then come all the guesses of the mystery object. Um, <laughs> and uh, so in the Brock painting, um, 
Mallory agrees with you. She thinks they look like boots. Um, I kind of thought the mystery object looked like a ceramic container of some kind with a, a lid on it. Um, and George says that it looks like a bust of a helmeted head. Um, and so Mallory wants to know, what's your favorite still life in the Dixon collection um, to write about? What was your favorite still life in the Dixon collection to write about for the upcoming permanent collection catalog? Um, I think that my favorite was the, um, the Taylor. I really enjoyed writing about that one and learning about her relationship with Blanche Lazelle. And yeah, I think that one was my favorite. Let's see, I'm trying to figure out how to share this, Lindley. Do I need to, um, I need to pull up, I'm sorry, y'all. I'm not that good at Zoom. To be perfectly honest, I have no idea. Well, I just want to, how do I create? Okay, I know what to do, I think. Yes? No. I am going to invite everyone to um, either type in another question. Um, Julie says, great job, Katie, oh, by the way. Nice. Thank you. Thanks. And uh, also Suzanne says, great presentation. Thank you. So if anyone has any last questions, you can type them in or we can unmute and, uh, and you can ask Katie any questions you might have. Oh, and it looks like Katie got those uh, links. I did. The chat. I did. So you can copy those if you'd like. And, um, and yes, I highly recommend JT's videos and also um, Kristen's, Kristen Allen's videos are great. And um, please, if you have not seen this current exhibition, and if you just haven't seen our permanent collection for a while and you would like to, then go to the link that, uh, that Katie put down there in the chat and make an appointment to go to the Dixon because it's well worth it. I, the Caladiums are gorgeous in the gardens and the exhibitions are fantastic. And our permanent collection is always wonderful to see. So anybody else have any last things to say. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Katie. I enjoyed it. Oh, hi, Mama. Thank you. <laughs> Good job, Katie. Thank you. It's quite the stack of papers, Mom. <laughs> yes, I know. It's all my work. <laughs> you got a lot of catching up to do. Hey, someone helped me, though. We had, um, uh, what's his name? The 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 Tiger King on as my screen, you know, before. <laughs> so we didn't want to embarrass you. He you helped take him down. Thank you for that. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much. And come back next week. Um, I have to cheat and tell you who's next week. It's Julie. Julie Perley next week. And so come on back and get more Dixon curatorial. <laughs> that was good. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thanks, everybody. Thank Bye -bye. you. See you next week, everyone. Thanks for coming.